I think of us as having kind of a dual purpose, really. One of those purposes is to honor and nurture a vibrant humanism within Unitarian Universalism. Those Unitarian Universalists who identify as both UU and humanist and are interested in making sure that humanism is a really vital force within Unitarian Universalism. And then I think the other piece, which we're really growing into as an organization, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of the ways that I see that happening, is to be the link between Unitarian Universalist humanism and humanism found in other movements. And that might be humanism within ethical culture, which is another essentially religious philosophical movement. It might be secular humanism. It might be the humanism found with the American Humanist Association, which tends to be kind of an umbrella organization around humanism. So we are both that internal piece of nurture and support and also really working to be kind of connectors and bridge builders with humanism at large. Welcome to Books and Ideas, the podcast where we talk with interesting people from a wide variety of fields. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and before I tell you about today's guest, I want to remind you that you can find additional episodes of Books and Ideas at my website, booksandideas.com. You can also subscribe to Books and Ideas in your favorite podcasting app. You can send me feedback at docartemis at gmail.com, submit voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis, and also post to the Books and Ideas Facebook fan page. Finally, you can support Books and Ideas financially at patreon.com forward slash books and ideas, or make a direct donation via the Venmo app where my username is docartemis. My guest today is Amanda Poppy, current president of the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association and contributor to the book Humanist Voices in Unitarian Universalism. Several years ago, I interviewed Becky Hale, who was the president of the American Humanist Association. So I refer you back to episode 53 if you're unfamiliar with humanism. The focus of this interview is the overlap between Unitarian Universalism and humanism. Whatever your particular beliefs may be, I hope that this interview will expand your horizons. Welcome to Books and Ideas, Amanda. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Oh, thank you so much for asking. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've been a member of the American Humanist Association for a number of years, and then I joined the Unitarian Universalist Church of Birmingham in Alabama, I think maybe two or three years ago. So I learned about your organization, the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association, actually from that book, Humanist Voices in Unitarian Universalism. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 And I actually had Becky Hale, who, you know, is past president of the American Humanist Association on this podcast. It was several years ago. So what I was hoping that we could do was to explore the relationship between humanism and Unitarian Universalism. Sure. Absolutely. So perhaps you could just start by giving my listeners a brief introduction to the organization that you're the president of. For sure. Yeah. So I serve as president of the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association, or often folks will say the UUHA because Unitarian Universalists never met an acronym they didn't like. That organization used to actually be called the Humanists. So like the word humanist with two U's. And it changed a while back before I came on, but some of your listeners might remember that earlier name. It's the same organization. And I think of us as having kind of a dual purpose, really. One of those purposes is to honor and nurture a vibrant humanism within Unitarian Universalism. Those Unitarian Universalists who identify as both UU and humanist and are interested in making sure that humanism is a really vital force within Unitarian Universalism. So that's kind of part of who and what we serve. 
or those folks in that mission. And then I think the other piece, which we're really growing into as an organization, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of the ways that I see that happening, is to be the link between Unitarian Universalist humanism and humanism found in other movements. And that might be humanism within ethical culture, which is another essentially religious philosophical movement. It might be secular humanism. It might be the humanism found with the American Humanist Association, which tends to be kind of an umbrella organization around humanism. So we are both that internal piece of nurture and support and also really working to be kind of connectors and bridge builders with humanism at large. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, One of the things we did at UCB is we um, started a discussion group, I guess you would call it, of humanists. And we only meet once a month. But one of our goals is to try to reach people who, because this is Alabama, okay? And so if you want to do anything that's at all humanist, you know, there aren't that many opportunities. And so we're trying to get the word out that there's a place for anyone who considers themselves a humanist within UU. We haven't really accomplished that yet, but that is our sort of <laughs> our long-term goal. <laughs> and and one reason why I wanted to talk with you was so that I could create something that maybe I could use for outreach purposes beyond, you know, my normal podcasting efforts. So you sort of talked a little bit about goals, but is there any other goal of your organization that you didn't mention? We are interested in humanist ideas and in sharing those ideas with each other, both, again, kind of within Unitarian Universalist humanism and then beyond. And so you'll see with, for many years, we've published the Journal of Religious Humanism. We also have a Facebook presence and a Twitter presence and all of that. And in many ways, those are used not just by the organization, but really by thinkers by clergy, by professors, and also by folks who run their local humanist chapter within the Unitarian Universalist congregation they go to, just as you do, who run a humanist group in their local area and who have ideas about humanism that they want to share. We really try to create spaces where those ideas can be shared with each other. We have a couple programs that help us to do that. One of them is a a relatively new program called the UUHA Ambassadors Program. So I'd love to talk to you about that. And then, of course, we do workshops at GA pretty frequently. We have a big booth display at GA. And really, all of that is geared toward connecting each other and connecting people with ideas. And for the sake of listeners who don't know what GA is, that's the General Assembly, which Unitarians have every summer. I'm actually hoping to go to that for the first time this year. So what's the relationship between the American Humanist Association and UUHA? So there's actually, I would say, no formal relationship between the American Humanist Association and the the organization I'm president of, the UUHA. That said, we are frequently in the same rooms. So both of us are member organizations of the Secular Coalition for America. So we're often in the same kind of member meeting space that way. Very frequently, we're at shared educational events. And that, to me, really speaks to that part of the UUHA's mission that's about connecting beyond Unitarian Universalism. Okay, so I probably should have asked you this at the very beginning, but what is humanism? (laughs) Well, I think that's like a seven-hour answer, really. (laughs) I will say part of what I love about humanism is that by its very nature, because it is a free-thinking tradition, it's actually hard to pin down a particular definition. There's no canonical definition. There's no there's no authority to say, this is it, that's the answer. And that's exactly as it should be, right? Humanism has always been a tradition of people asking questions, answering them together, re-asking them, and sort of continuing to explore. At its core, humanism is a life stance that could be a, you might experience that as religious or philosophical One of my congregants says a wisely lived life. I love that phrase. So a life stance that is grounded in human experience, that honors the worth of every human, and that posits that the solutions to problems come from humans. 
Now, I would say in all of those cases that it's really important to remember and to honor very deeply the way that humans are part of an ecosystem, animals among other animals, very much part of the larger natural whole. And I think humanism has done some good work in moving in that direction in the last couple of decades. But at its core, that's it for me. It's a life stance grounded in the human experience that kind of trusts the human experience and is interested in the human experience and that sees that solutions to problems come from humans. It's our responsibility, in other words. In my group, we've come down to that as being the key thing as we're responsible. Humans are responsible. It doesn't mean humans are special or better or any of that kind of stuff. It just means that we're responsible and nobody is going to come and save us from ourselves. I was noticing, looking at your website and comparing it to the American Humanist Association's website, that you both use the phrase not relying on supernatural sources. But I noticed that on the American Humanist Association, you know, they explicitly describe their position as non-theistic. But your organization does not require that a person be a non-theist to identify as a humanist. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And I would say that's consistent with humanism within Unitarian Universalism in general. It is consistent, at least with my understanding of humanism, that it's not an either or choice. It often is for people. People may experience that personally, but I don't think it has to be. And actually, you mentioned that Humanist Voices book, Humanist Voices and Unitarian Universalism. The chapter I wrote for that book is actually all focused on the idea that we don't have to see humanism as the opposite of theism, as in choose only one door. And I see that in the congregation that I serve. I serve an explicitly humanist congregation with really core humanist values. This is now in my full-time professional role as a clergy person to that congregation. That includes people who identify personally as atheist or agnostic and theist. We have folks who identify personally as Christian and that is not inconsistent with their humanist values in any way. And then that's a really important point to make. And I think that that's, because I've had a lot of involvement in the AHA, I think that that is a differentiating position. Because AHA has become, you know, explicitly non-theist. And they put a lot of effort into trying to support the rights of non-theists, because obviously in the current political climate, we are being attacked. And then, you know, where I live, I would think that it's probably more common for a person who identifies as humanist to also be a non-theist, just because we don't have that those little subtle groups that you might have in, in an area where there's more choices. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The subtlety can be a luxury, right? <laughs> yeah. Where does the Humanist Manifesto come into the story? Does your organization have anything to do with that? Again, sort of not explicitly. We don't have an explicit organizational link. You know, the Humanist Manifesto, I think at this point really is, by, we're on our third iteration now, I think. And it, does tend to feel very linked to the American Humanist Association. Originally, of course, the American Humanist Association wasn't around yet, I believe, when the first Humanist Manifesto was written. And it was a thought piece and signed by people from many different places, right? But signed by scientists and by professors and by Unitarian ministers um, and a Universalist minister. And so it was really an articulation of those people of a set of new ideas, a way that they wanted to orient and center their lives that felt different than what was already out there as possible for people. And I think as you've seen different iterations of the Humanist Manifesto that, you know, it's changed and altered a little bit, the language has changed, but it still is a, a thought document in a lot of ways. One of the things that's very interesting to me about humanism and the different kinds of humanism is that I think you can both look at different thoughts within humanism, right? And this humanism really insists on naturalism. This humanism can co-occur with theism, you know, all of those differences. 
But one of the things that I see as a real difference is actually the practice of humanism and what it looks like for people to practice it differently. And I think that's one of the places you get into the difference between religious humanism or what's sometimes called congregational humanism and secular humanism. Often people in those two different camps, right, two different practices might actually share all the same thoughts, but how they live them, what they literally where they put their bodies and, you know, how they gather with people looks different from each other. In Unitarian Universalism, we have the seven principles which define what we stand for since we don't have a creed. And last year, the American Humanist Association came up with something really clever called the Ten Commitments to take the place of the Ten Commandments. Yes, they like to play with that all the time, you know, the, it's one of their things, yeah. And my first response to that was how much it sounds like the seven principles. Like you say, there's a lot of overlap. So in your role as president of UUHA, do you have much exposure to any tension going on within um, Unitarian Universalism regards to humanism? Because a sense of tension comes through that book, for sure. <laughs> right, yeah. It's interesting to me. I was raised Unitarian Universalist. I'm actually third generation, which is not so common. I hope it becomes more and more common that more and more of our children and youth end up finding a place in adulthood in our tradition. So I'm third generation UU. I was raised that way in upstate New York in what was really a humanist UU congregation. That was the predominant theological orientation um, or philosophical orientation of the congregation. And it still is now at that congregation. And so I grew up with this sort of idea of humanism versus theism and oh, this tension within the movement. And of course, I still hear it. And I often hear the back and forth, the movements becoming more theistic or the kinds of songs we sing feel more theistic and I think every movement has pendulum moves. I want to break in here just a moment to tell you about how you can support Books and Ideas. I've been creating Books and Ideas since 2006, and it's always had a modest audience because it doesn't fall into any niche or genre. I recently increased my more successful show, Brain Science, to twice a month, and I seriously considered stopping Books and Ideas. But I decided to continue because of the enjoyment I get from talking to such a wide range of guests. My main ongoing challenge is the expense of audio editing. That's the reason I set up a dedicated Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash books and ideas. You can also make direct donations to Books and Ideas via the Venmo app where my username is Doc Artemis. Your support is greatly appreciated. I think every movement has pendulum moves. And so that's likely true. The language changes and shifts what's popular or what the quote unquote big congregations are doing shifts over time. You know, if you look back at Unitarian Universalism of 1960 or even further back into the Unitarianism of 1940, you would see more theological language than we see now. So there was a shift toward humanism and there may well be kind of shifts back. And maybe this is because I was raised Unitarian Universalist. I didn't leave another tradition. I've never needed to let go of that baggage, right? I didn't ever pick it up. It's all just words. There's always going to be those movements within our tradition, within the tradition that we share. There's, because that is Unitarian Universalism. It is a pluralistic religious tradition. It's going to have atheists and agnostics and theists and Christians and Hindus and Jews and Muslims. And we're always going to be playing with language and metaphor and imagery. So I do hear that. I sort of don't always buy in as much, or maybe I just don't feel the anxiety around it in the same way, right? Because it'll swing again. And because there always has been, for me at least, space for different articulations, different language, different metaphor within the broader tradition. One of the things I will say in my group is when people are coming out of religions, which is not your experience, and they're looking for something else, and they go in and it feels so much like church, 
that can be very off-putting if they've been wounded. And, and how do we, I mean, I know, I mean, when I interviewed Becky Hale, she actually referred to the fact that she had been a UU at some point and isn't, I guess, because the congregations where she lives are very theistic. And so the challenge I'm thinking is, I know we have a whole generation of um, people with no, the famous nuns, and how are we going to reach them in a way that they're going to be able to feel comfortable? Is that one of the goals of your organization? Because you you mentioned being sort of an outreach. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of our programs is called the Free Thinker Friendly Program. We invite Unitarian Universalist congregations who I will say, you know, I among congregations in America are already on the free thinker friendly spectrum, but we invite them to just take a look at their language, at their website, at the offerings that they have, and make sure that there are entry points for folks who would identify as humanist, who might identify as free thinkers or as agnostics or atheists or naturalists, whatever kind of language they might use. And again, that doesn't mean that there aren't also entry points for folks who identify as theist or as spiritual but not religious or as seekers or whatever it might be. It's just making sure that there are plenty of doors for people to come in and to know that they're welcome. And so that Free Thinker Friendly program has people do a little bit of an audit of their language. Many congregations have some kind of welcome statement, right? And to make sure that that welcome statement includes, not exclusively, but among other things, some articulation of free thinker, right? Of humanist, whatever that might be, that they check in with their minister. So the free thinker friendly program requires the minister's buy-in and sign off. It is in no way a sort of anti-clerical, like, oh, let's put one over it was created by ministers, in fact, and by lay folks working together. It really is, how can we make sure that we have those doors available for the nuns, for the formerly religious, for people who have experienced trauma in religious settings, to know that this is a place where they can be welcome with their full selves? I know my answer for me, but what would you say to somebody if they asked you, well, why should I bother? Why should I bother being part of a congregation? Yes. I mean, I think about the folks that come into the congregation that I serve, many of whom have had no religious engagement at all since childhood, maybe, or potentially never. Consistently, they say, I am here because I'm having trouble finding community. Often, I see that especially with folks in their kind of late 20s, 30s, who maybe haven't yet or will not choose to have a family. So they don't have sort of that community that school can sometimes create for parents and children who have their professional lives, which may be fulfilling, but do not have that deeper community. There was one congregant who was raised totally secular. She's an atheist. She's never, had never thought she was going to want to be involved in a congregation. So it was a funny story. Her aunt was actually, is an Episcopal priest and I went to seminary with her aunt. So she was talking with her aunt and she said, the thing is though, if I get sick, who's going to bring me a casserole? (laughs) And it was just chance that her aunt said, well, hang on. I know somebody who serves a congregation of people that include atheists just like you and they'll bring you casseroles. And of course, a congregation is way more than casseroles. But I thought, I loved the way she articulated it, that she knew that there was this system of people around her that she didn't have and that she could have. I think that's what I most hear people say when they come into newcomer Q&As, you know, when they come into the congregation for the first time. They also will talk about raising their children and wanting help raising their children with their values. I think a lot of parents feel like, oh, I'll do that on my own. I'll just teach my child my values. But it's a lot easier to do it with other people, to do it in partnership and through a program. I hear sometimes about people wanting to do either service work or social justice work and wanting to do it again in community with other folks. People talk about how important even that hour on Sunday morning is to set aside, to center down, to ground themselves, to think more broadly than they usually do, 
whether they are finding kind of hope and comfort there or whether they're being disturbed in that good kind of disturbance, right? Being asked to really think deeply about something, how important it is to have that time set aside in their lives. So that's what I tend to hear. And certainly that's why I would be going to a congregation if I didn't, if I weren't the clergy of one, right? Absolutely. I mean, for me, it was, I would put community at the top. And then once I got there, the other part, like my congregation has a history of social justice going back to the civil rights movement. And, you know, I go and and they make me feel uncomfortable, you know. <laughs> it's really easy to get kind of in your little groove, everything's okay for me, place. And I pretty much try to ignore the news as a mental health choice. <laughs> so I have to get disturbed by the news every Sunday <laughs> because my minister is very conscious of the news. And she's always mentioning the, the most recent horrible thing that happened, trying to help the congregation to deal so all those things are, you did a pretty good job of summarizing it. And one reason why I wanted to have you on the show that I didn't mention at the beginning is that my audience is largely secular, partly because of the origins of the show many years ago. And I, I just wanted to sort of give them something else to think about of, well, if you ever thought about, you know, I could use some community, where could I find a place where I would, I would feel comfortable? Yep, absolutely. It's so interesting to me because I often find that folks will come to the congregation and they'll say, I've known about you for 10 years, right? <laughs> or 15 years. You know, sometimes, sometimes they're brand new. Sometimes they say, I had no idea something like this existed. I'm so excited. Here I am, you know. But not infrequently, someone will say, Oh, I've been thinking about it for 10 or 15 years. And my partner just died. That's what happened to me, actually. Yeah. Yep. And I just went through a divorce and some life change has happened for them. And this thing that they knew was out there for them, there is suddenly a space in their life that needs that thing. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've got that story yourself. I always in those moments feel lucky that they knew about us, even though it took them 15 years to come through the door, because then we were able to be there at the moment when they needed us. Well, I'll share a little bit of my story with you and my listeners. The first time I heard about Unitarian and Universalism was in, I think, 1979, when I first left Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, having been a Jehovah's Witness is really hard to be something else. <laughs> you just can't go down to the Baptist church. <laughs> so the first time I went I didn't like it because it felt like everyone was feeling all guilty about not being Baptist. That was just my sense of the people. I felt like somebody just left my brain out of a cage. Let's celebrate. And unfortunately, that was not what I experienced. I did go, you know, off and on over maybe once every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And maybe about 10 years ago, my, my best friend joined the congregation. And so she was always telling me about it. And I was thinking, well, I'd like to do that someday. But my husband and I had this Sunday morning routine that did not include going to church. You know, so I just had it on the back burner until after he, when he died, I was like, okay, well, I've, I've known that I was going to do this someday. So, yeah. And I guess that's not an unusual story. I think that's right. Yeah. In fact, I think sometimes I'll have folks that come and they like everything about it, but there isn't a hole in their life that's shaped like the congregation, if that makes sense. Sort of where you were maybe when you went in every 10 years and maybe you thought, oh, you know, this is okay. You know, this is nice. This is interesting. But yeah, I've, I have something else I do on Sunday morning or I don't, need, I don't really need this in my life right now. And that, that's okay. I'm just always glad when they know about us at the times that they do, that they do need us. And the other thing I would say is I like to say to folks, if you've been to one Unitarian Universalist congregation, <laughs> you've been, you've been, been one, to one. one. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Because they are so different from each other. And that's part of the beauty of it. There's no higher authority that says, 
hey, you know, I'm the bishop, you have to do it this way. It is up to the individual congregation. But that means that they really are, they have their own cultures that have developed over the decades or even, you know, up in New England over the centuries. And so someone could go visit a UU congregation and and have a very churchy experience, might feel very much like a Protestant service. And then next week, go to the UU congregation one town over and have a completely different experience with secular music and contemporary feel and sort of, you know, have it feel much more like a gathering of like-minded people sharing values and building community together in a pretty non-traditional way. So I always do think it's great to shop around and find something. Now, obviously in places where there's one UU congregation for every 500 miles, that luxury is not possible. And then that congregation has to really work to make sure that they have all those doors we talked about earlier, all those openings for people with different philosophical or theological orientations. Yeah, I think there's currently three congregations in Alabama. Because we just had someone get ordained and move to another town. So that's progress. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, it, Amanda, is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? I think the only other thing I'd, I'd love to just tell you about is, so I serve a congregation that is affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association, but whose core identity is actually ethical culture, which is another progressive non-traditional religious movement started in the 19th century, which is part of the humanist movement. So kind of, I like to think of them as like cousins. And if you look back in the history, they literally were cousins at different points in their history. And so because I'm clergy in that tradition, as well as clergy in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I can get humanists of different stripes to play together to get ethical culturists and Unitarian Universalists and humanistic Jews and secular humanists to all be in the same room and share with each other and enjoy the subtleties of difference rather than saying, oh, that's not the kind of humanist I am. Because there's a little bit of that. I mean, you know, we've all got our reptile brains setting up our tribes, right? So how can we share with each other and collaborate with each other and revel in some of those differences So I was one of the co-founders of the Humanist Collaboratory. It began as the Humanist Clergy Collaboratory. It's now the Humanist Collaboratory, including secular organizers and leaders, bringing together, it's a national gathering that brings together humanists, leaders, clergy, organizers from many different traditions. And that's been very exciting. I think the next one is scheduled hopefully for spring 2021. So not the spring, but next year. And I've handed off some of the leadership to other folks. That's something I feel really proud of because it got some people in the same room who I felt like needed to know each other. We were all working about on the same kinds of things and caring about the same kind of things. The other thing I would add is I'm actually getting ready to start a podcast myself on humanist parenting called Raising Humanists. So if any of your listeners have that particular interest, if they've got kids at home or kids that they're involved with and they want to think about how to parent them. Uh, I hope that they'll take a look for that. It should be launching in February and tune in. Great. And you'll have to send me a a link for that when that goes live. I I know of people in my congregation that would definitely be interested in it. Yeah. One of our focuses of our congregation, you know, is working on the religious education for the kids, because that is what brings a lot of people in is worrying about their children. And in fact, we just made an investment in, you know, a full-time person for that because it's so important. I will let you know when, when your interview goes live. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for asking me. It was great to chat with you. Thank you for listening to today's interview with Amanda Poppy from the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association. To be honest, I recorded this interview to help promote my local UU humanist group. I realize many of you may know nothing about Unitarian Universalism, though more of you are likely to be familiar with the American Humanist Association. If you would like to learn more, I highly recommend the book Humanist Voices in Unitarian Universalism. And of course, you can check out the Humanist Manifesto via Google. I will have links to everything we talked about in the show notes on my website at booksandideas.com. 
I'd also love to hear from you what you think about this episode and books and ideas in general. Please email me at docartemis at gmail.com. You can submit voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis or post to the Books and Ideas fan page on Facebook. My Twitter handle is also at Doc Artemis. And please consider supporting Books and Ideas at patreon.com forward slash books and ideas. Next month, I'll be back with a fascinating interview with Jeremy Sherman, author of Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Cells. This is a follow-up to the interview I did several years ago with Terence Deacon about his book, Incomplete Nature, How Mind Emerged from Matter. Until then, I hope you'll check out my other podcasts, Brain Science and Grain Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Books and Ideas is copyright 2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at docartemis at gmail.com. Theme music for Books and Ideas is The Open Door by Beatnik Turtle. Please visit their website at beatnikturtle.com.